My book, The Spirit of Work, Timeless Wisdom, Current Realities, is now published. By interweaving science, business, and sacred texts from the world's great spiritual traditions, The Spirit of Work offers a high-level but approachable way to view and structure work from individual community and institutional perspectives. As part of the book's reach and outreach, I will be adding some solo podcasts and interviews with authors who write to build healthy workplaces to give you a taste of how the book's concepts can enhance your workplace experience. To get to the Spirit of Work links and purchase from online stores directly, click on the online store of your choice from my website, which is shiftworkplace.com slash the spirit of work. Make sure you put hyphens in between the words the spirit of work to ensure the correct URL comes up. So that's shiftworkplace.com slash the spirit of work with hyphens. And that's how you'll get to your goal. Looking forward to your feedback. Hello, Culture and Leadership Connections podcast listeners. Today, I'm very excited to present to you Christine Gibson. Dr. Christine Gibson is a family physician and trauma therapist in Calgary, Canada. She created a residency in health equity, runs an international nonprofit working in East Africa and Asia, and is a social entrepreneur. She is the author of the soon-to-be-published book, The Modern Trauma Toolkit, and a mental health speaker on social media, known as TikTok Trauma Doc. You should follow her. Her TikToks are excellent. I love them. She elevates the conversation about trauma and post-traumatic growth on her TikTok channel. She's a co-founder of Safer Spaces Training, where she facilitates professionals and corporations in becoming trauma-informed. Welcome, Christine. Well, thanks for having me, Marie. It's great to be here. I am so excited to hear about your interview because you have such an interesting bio and interesting life, and I really enjoyed meeting you. And now I'm really looking forward to how you're going to answer the questions. I think it's going to be great for everybody who's listening to the podcast. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to spread the word about the kinds of communities I'm involved in. So everything that you're doing is about your professional work that we read in the in your bio, but tell the audience a little bit about who you are personally and a little bit about you and your background. Sure. Yeah, I'm a family doctor for about 20 years now, and that time has been in Calgary. But with the international work, I've actually been living abroad for about three months a year up until the pandemic. So there's the before times and the after times in how my world has been constructed. So tell us a little bit more about your background. You know, where did you grow up and where have you been before you became a family doctor? And what have you done before you started the not-for-profit? Yeah, fill us in with a, little, a few more details. Oh, gosh. Um, I grew up in Edmonton. I was a pretty academic kid. I started traveling when I was about 19. So I suspect that that's infused a lot of my curiosity and desire to figure out how other people do things. And were you an only child or were there other children in your family? I have a younger sister. She's a teacher. Mm -hmm. And what did your parents do? Everyone comes from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So my dad was from Scotland. So he came to Canada when he was 20 and he came without a lot of education, but with a lot of grit. So my mom really kind of helped him develop a plan for his career trajectory. And he was in a very traditional kind of stoic British household. So he kind of really nurtured the opposite sensibilities. My dad was very emotionally available, very, you know, loving and sweet with his two daughters. So we, we were really lucky in our household that way. And mom came from multi-generation Ukrainians. And then her dad was an American who had recovered from polio at a very young age, but had very significant kind of sequelae from that. So I think that really infused a lot of where she came from. Do you think that influenced your desire to become a physician in some way? I think both parents had some obstacles in their way around who they wanted to be and what they wanted to do in the world. So I think it infuses my work in health equity spaces, but I don't think it influenced necessarily the drive to be a physician. I remember specifically my mom saying when I was making this choice, oh gosh, Christy, like you don't have to do that. That sounds really hard. <laughs> like, just do something a little bit easier. That's, you know, you're going to still feel fulfilled. But yeah, at that point, I really wanted to. So no, I don't think they necessarily influenced it in that way, but they just created a really open environment where I could explore anything I wanted to do. Oh, that's great. Well, that leads me to my next question, which is, can you share a couple of incidents from your childhood and adolescence that you think were formative for you? Something that stands out in your memory. 
I think one is around intuition. I remember my mom was really good with intuitively knowing where I was at and what I needed before I could even really articulate it. She pulled me out of a French immersion elementary school and into a more academic environment, which was so good for me at the time. Like I didn't really know what I needed, but I needed a bit more creativity and I needed a bit more challenge. And she just was really intuitive around those things. I even, I remember something that's always struck me. We had the funnest exercises in our grade six class where we did, instead of math, we had to like actually play the stock market. We had to pick our stocks and then calculate how they were doing. And back then the stocks were listed in the newspaper. And so I remember circling things in pencil and going through these activities. And I remember having this huge assignment for my math class and I had been working diligently on it and left it on my desk. And my mom had gone to work before I took the school bus to school. And for some reason she knew she got to work and she knew I'd left it on my desk. So she drove back home, picked up my assignment and dropped it off at school. And I just remember thinking like, there's a different way of knowing I'm studying, you know, math and English and these defined subjects, but my mom has tapped into a totally different way of knowing. And I benefited from that greatly, but it also really made me curious about What's it like to be tapped into that? Hmm, that's a really interesting memory. And I also really like the memory about math being applied to the stock market because it gives you such an immediate life application. And that's often when children have difficulty connecting with math. That's what's missing for them. Mm -hmm. And that your mother could just intuitively know that something needed to be done and to tap into that. It's a really nice uh, sort of holistic way that you experienced growing up. Yeah, it was really good to be challenged. It was also really good to have like a safe home base mm -hmm. and kind of it's that safe space you can explore and then come back to. I've always had that as a kid and then created that as an adult. Wonderful. So what about as an adolescent or a young adult, what stands out as being formative for you? I think the main thing was that I didn't really have a group that I fit into. I was kind of adjacent in a lot of groups. I would hang out with, you know, the people who were sporty. So I was on the swim team and the water polo team, but it wasn't like the true sports, but I, I had some friends who were in that group. And then I had some friends who were, you know, listening to Led Zeppelin and smoking various substances on weekends. I had some friends that were deeply religious I had some friends that were outdoorsy and then I was a geek. I was in the academic international baccalaureate classes. So I never really felt like I fit somewhere, but I think it was the beginning of becoming a bit of a transdisciplinarian in my adult life is kind of straddling these different things. So it was hard as a kid to not feel like I fit in. And I had friends that were members of each of those groups, but I think that ability to be a bit of a chameleon is something that I've owned since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I identify with that. I had a similar experience when I was growing up and that sort of being on the outside but having one or two connections in from different groups allows you to sort of, Edward Said calls that being a public intellectual, but I think it's more like being intuitively looking for how you can connect with people and create bridges. Mm, I like that. I haven't heard that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's great. From the groups that you were born into, because everybody's born into a place, a region, a country, a ethnicity, or a variety of ethnicities, and they have religious backgrounds or none, but they're still born into a kind of an umbrella of the Christian culture, Buddhist culture, Muslim culture, depending on where they are. There's so many things influence the groups that we're in. If you live on the prairies or in the, near the ocean or on the mountains, all that. So what do you think has influenced your development from those groups that you were born into? What groups stand out for you? I think the cultural groups have probably influenced me more than anything else. My dad came from Scotland, so he grew up in a very small coal mining town in the district of Fife. So that's the closest big city is Edinburgh, but he was very much in the countryside in a mining town with very few industries. So he dropped out of school at 16 and the culture he was baked into was very blue collar and the life he would have been locked into was very defined. And so what was influential about my dad was his background, not just in Scotland, but also in kind of the sense of escaping this defined way that you're supposed to live. And so him coming to Canada at age 20 with like a guitar slung over his shoulder. He was very musical and very, very smart, but stifled. And so yeah. that smart, but stifled thing is something he broke free for me. And my mom's side, there's a Ukrainian influence. So, I mean, apart from the fact I have Ukrainian evacuees living with me right now, 
my only grandparents that had a lot of cultural influence over me was Ukrainian. And it wasn't necessarily just like egg painting at Easter. There was a way of thinking, really scrappy, really strong work ethic. And, you know, I guess the Ukrainians that came to Canada are quite different than the ones who remain there. But like we pioneered and settled the prairies. So we came from a small town named Ispas in Ukraine and settled in Prairie, Alberta in 1903 and created the town of Ispas. And it was a community of Ukrainian farmers. And there's been a lot of merging into culture since then and, you know, kind of forgetting our roots, but I think they're really deep. And the more that I understand who I am in the world now, the more I understand that those roots were really influential for me, not just in influencing my personality and kind of drive, but also the work that I do around equity. Both Scottish people and Ukrainian people have experienced a lot of oppression and marginalization. And I didn't know that as a kid, but I definitely know that as an adult. And you felt it coming through their attitudes about things and the way they approached life, even if you couldn't articulate it. Yeah. I mean, my my grandmother had some pretty strange fixed opinions about things and it was very much the underdog mentality or the scarcity mentality. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't have articulated it then. But also both groups, because they were able to be conventionally successful, having come from marginalized cultures, there was also this sense of expansion. Like there's just nothing I can't do. And I have very much an abundance framework. And it's not necessarily that I came from that, but it still was catalyzed in those spaces. You think that pioneering mentality and that scrappiness that you mentioned before, you think that that's foundational to you in some way? Absolutely. I think it has influenced my career tremendously. I think that in a lot of ways, I've been an early adopter of ideas and trends, sometimes to my detriment, because in medicine and healthcare, it is quite conventional and traditional. But I do think that it allows me to innovate and to take risks that a lot of other people wouldn't take. So even just joining TikTok, I mean, there's not a lot of adults on TikTok. Well, I thought that, but it's, it turns out there's a huge mental health community and, you know, there's an HR community. There's so many different things at the intersection of what I do that are well-formed intentional communities on TikTok, anti-oppressive work and indigenous ways of knowing. I, I just find it such an amazing platform and I never would have dreamed of that, but I'm not afraid to take medium-sized risks and every once in a while, big risks. So I don't know a lot of other doctors who run a nonprofit, a cooperative and a corporation. I like to do big projects and just be really expansive. I don't think I would have been content just being a traditional family doctor for four years. I think I could have done it, but I think it would have stifled a lot of creativity and innovation that was possible. And I think that's true of a lot of physicians. We have the capacity to be more, but we don't necessarily feel like we have the social position or the resources or the permission to just go do it. And I didn't ask for those things. I was just like, okay, what can we do next? Mm -hmm. Now, what about groups that you chose to belong to? Like being a physician would be a group. You started talking about that already, but People choose to belong to things or they choose to expand something that they were only dimly aware of when they were younger um, into their adulthood. Do you have something like that that comes to mind? Yeah, I wouldn't say I've joined a lot of formal groups, but communities for sure. Communities of practice, absolutely. So it's been interesting. I was in a lot of traditional groups up until 2014. And that year I was in the earthquake in Nepal inadvertently. I was doing some academic consulting with a small school and that really shifted who I saw myself as being in the world and what my possibilities would be. And I've really expanded my group since then. So before 2014, I was doing some nonprofit work and I was a physician, but those are pretty well defined. And since then, the expansion has just been, you know, incredible. I'm in somatic therapy spaces and social media spaces, you know, cooperatives, social innovation. So I've been studying social innovation and design thinking, social entrepreneurship. So I've, I've entered into a lot of spaces that I couldn't have even dreamed about prior to 2014. And that's been, you know, really, really interesting. And I think maybe the theme that would have applied from when I was younger is just that ability to straddle different groups and 
infuse elements of one into the other and just be really anti-disciplinary, like not letting myself fit into one box, but exploring a lot of other, not necessarily boxes that exist, but containers that exist. What was it about the earthquake that caused a shift in you? Um, trauma. It was a very, very traumatic experience, like a, a near death experience. Absolutely. Uh-huh. You know, 10,000 people died that they counted, but there was far more. I was in a building that I could hear all of the other buildings come down around me because I was in the old city of Patton. And luckily the apartment I was renting that year, which was not the case in previous years, but that year I had chosen an apartment building that was of newer construction. And so that building survived. But when I went to run into the courtyard to escape the building coming down on me, all the buildings around me had come down and spilled into the courtyard. There was just dust and bricks, like a waterfall coming into the courtyard. And that experience really shifted my sense of timelines, like the contribution that I want to make and the meaning that I want to have. And it also shifted something energetically. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to get woo woo about it, but I do think that my energy body shifted at that time. And I'm more in a state of flow with things that are meant to come my way. And I have a greater understanding of that now. And I very much feel like I'm driftwood in the flow of a river much more than I was before. I can imagine that. I was in Haiti after the last big earthquake and I was there for a tremor and I also saw what happened to people and I lived in a blown out building (laughs) or camped out on the ground. And so I wasn't in the trauma, but I saw the shocks of the trauma around me and that shifted very much how I thought and have experienced the world. Although I'd experienced other kinds of traumas previously, this was really earth-shaking trauma. It was significant on a very large scale. And I was thinking about people that had been through this several times in their lives and then experienced being colonized by three different countries and how that would have affected their sense of who they are. And it really affected how I work as well. I imagine Mm -hmm. for you, you were in that and you felt the buildings coming down around you. It would have been a thousand times the experience that I had. So uh, I can imagine a glimmer of what it must have been like. And the thing is that connects you with all of humanity because all of humanity has been traumatized and the large part of the world has had severe trauma. And that's the differentiator is the trauma isn't the event. The trauma is your response to the event. And that's what I started to understand. Like I ended up in Singapore, I got evacuated and I went to see a psychiatrist and I said, I don't know if I have PTSD. And he explained, well, you're having a normal reaction to abnormal circumstances. Right. And that's when I started to really explore like what defines trauma. Uh And it helped me realize that we have all been through a collective trauma. I mean, we're all experiencing climate chaos and we've all been through a pandemic now, but how it subjectively takes place in our bodies and who still has trauma responses that linger, that's super different. And that's what got me really curious. What's the landscape that promotes these trauma responses to linger? And what can you do about it? And I was really surprised once I started asking that question as a family doctor, that it was influencing absolutely everything I saw, not just mental health, but physical health. And that's when I realized there weren't enough people in that space helping the greater public understand the influence of trauma on their lives and and their nervous systems and their well-being and their social lives and everything. It just infuses. And the word trauma sounds really heavy, but I think there's a way to break it down to help people understand that you can shift it back. If you've been influenced, if you've got these stuck trauma responses, there's a lot you can do. Yeah, because the body is intended to heal. The nervous system is also intended to heal. Our emotions are intended to heal. Our spirits, our hearts, our minds are intended to heal. That's just the natural process of being an organic being that's alive in the world. And so if you're moving forward with that, mindset, then people can heal from post-traumatic stress. They can heal from intergenerational trauma. They can, there's all sorts of stuff they can heal from, they can move forward from in their lives. And there are very few people who understand this. Even people working in the mental health area often don't understand it and haven't located where they're storing experiences in their body that are causing them to react instead of respond appropriately. As a physician, I didn't know a lot of the things that I know now. It it took hundreds and hundreds of hours of studying and like two years salary just to explore the ideas that I have explored, which is why I'm doing a doctorate now, because it's a doctorate of professional studies in public works, because I just felt like I've earned a doctorate with the amount I've had to study to understand this stuff. 
Um, but I don't want to do primary research again. So it was really nice to find a program that just acknowledged how much I had to study to unlearn a lot of what I learned in medical school and training and to just branch out into something completely different yet related. Way more people in mental health and and medicine need to understand some of these core concepts. I, I think it needs to be taught in elementary schools around emotional regulation and distress tolerance. And parents with young children. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely necessary. I'm really glad that you're doing the work. So um, tell me a little bit about your, your temperament and your personality. So temperament, of course, you're born with, and then of course it's nurtured, but you can see children from a young age have certain qualities that are specific and unique to them. So what would you say you were born with? And then what did you nurture or grow along the way? I think I was born with a significant curiosity. There's a photo of me as a baby in a diaper in our kitchen, covered in icing sugar, head to toe. (laughs) And my mom saying she just didn't really understand that not only would I get into the drawers, but I would just be opening everything in the drawer that would open. And the icing sugar was really easy because it was just in a bag and all I had to do was unroll it. And she would never have guessed that I would have thought to dump it on my head. (laughs) It's it's the cutest photo, really. But I, I think that innate curiosity has really fueled who I was back then. I did a lot of academic courses as a kid, but the stuff I really loved was at the intersection. I remember in high school, I was in IB English. And instead of studying the usual ways of learning English, we studied the Latin American authors and magic realism. And I've never been so happy in English in my life. And our assignments were to create a radio play, or we created a a Faustian diorama. And that ability to be that creative I mean, it was fuel to me. It was just so, so, so fun. And so I love the idea of doing something that's strongly academic, but infusing it with creativity and fun. And there wasn't a lot of room for that in medicine. So even though I wanted to own that capacity when I grew up, we kind of get stuck in a box and there's like algorithmic approaches to care. You see this, you put it in this box, which is a diagnosis, and then the treatment is an algorithm. And then you just try different algorithms. It's There wasn't a lot of room for honing your intuition, although there's certainly a role for it. Like we often get a sense of, are you sick or not sick? And what I was really yearning for was how can I bring that curiosity, creativity, and fun into this work? And especially in something like trauma, it seems so heavy, but TikTok was the perfect place to explore. And my book as well, like it's written at a grade eight level. It's very, very accessible. If there's jargon, I explain it so carefully and it's held really cautiously. Like I'm not trying to poke at anybody's trauma. I'm trying to explore around the edges in a really careful way. And And I think that that we did that in my English class, like how can you explore these really deep concepts, including things like colonial mentality, but do it in a way that's playful. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm really looking to do now is to explore these big concepts in a way that doesn't seem so burdensome and it's not reactivating your trauma responses. You can engage with it and still stay in a creative and playful frame of mind. Wow. I love that. First off, You are blessed to have had such wonderful teachers. Man, I don't think I've ever met anyone who's had such good teaching experiences of being a student with these creative teachers. That's fantastic. Yeah, I was lucky. Very lucky. And the other thing is the idea of having science and, and rigor also be fun and be playful. It's just, why not? I mean, who says it has to be dead serious all the time? My dad is in the hospital. He's 93. He's got a broken hip, broken shoulder. He has severe Alzheimer's. He's blind. He's almost totally deaf. And there is nothing fun in his life. And there is nothing fun about being in that hospital room. There is nothing playful. And if he's lucky, he's got a nurse who's who shows some kindness and care to him. Mostly that doesn't happen. And I can hardly wait to break him out of there. Like I <laughs> Every time I go on, I go, let's break this place. Let's leave. And he goes, what? What did you say? (laughs) Oh, I just, (laughs) there's nothing fun. But it would certainly be a wonderful healing place if there were something fun or even a little playfulness in the way people would interact with patients, you know? Absolutely. In 2020, I started a a cooperative. And when we were trying to figure out what it was we were doing in the world, it was a group of professionals and public. And Our intention was, how can we do things differently? And and we met based on our values, not necessarily a project, 
And so we were experimenting at first. Every month we would have a community of practice call where somebody would share the work that they do or a practice that they know about with the group. And we would just all participate over Zoom. It was actually so pleasant to do it during the pandemic because we could still feel like we had community. And in the end, the grant that we managed to secure through the city of Calgary was to form a music and breathwork pilot project for newcomers. So it was that intersection of people who aren't really getting their needs met through the mental health system that's traditional, whether it's a language barrier or it's just not culturally appropriate. So we wanted to try something different. And within our cooperative, we had people in my network that were ethnomusicologist who lives in Edmonton, Tiffany Sparrow, and Emma Harding. She's a vocal coach. And when I've gone through really tough times, I do singing lessons and I sing out my stress. And sometimes I just cry and I pick songs that kind of express the thing that I want to say, but I haven't got the words yet. And so Emma joined the team and, and they created programming for four different cultural communities here in Calgary. And we ran a music and breath project for a couple of months as a pilot. And we're trying to scale it up for long COVID recovery, actually, because we know it's more inclusive than a lot of the traditional programs that exist. And if you had asked me 10 years ago as a physician working in a hospital, because that's what I was doing was inpatient medicine up until 2017, would I ever see myself a part of a team that was doing music and breath for immigrant communities? I would never have dreamed of something so expansive. But now that's all I can dream about is what else can we do that is playful yet healing? And it embraces the whole human spirit and the whole human experience. Yeah, yeah. That's what you're doing that when you say expansive, I'm just seeing this as being so whole. It's so healthy. It's health promotion rather than disease identification. Oh, absolutely. And instead of looking at these communities for their vulnerabilities, which I've always been in health equity spaces and the places where I work, they really look at the vulnerabilities of these groups. And I just refuse to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at immigrant groups, like music and dance and singing have been part of drumming, have been a part of their cultural practices for so long. And then they come to Canada and they're expected to forget that as a healing modality, Mm -hmm. but it is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you tell me about a time when you I'm sure there are many. You became aware that your understanding of the world was specific to you and not just normal. A cultural dissonance moment. I'll give you an example. When I was in Japan, I thought I understood a little bit about Japanese culture because my dad's best friend was Japanese. We grew up with their family. And when I was in Japan, I realized something about bowing that I had not ever noticed before, which was that the bow was very sophisticated and nuanced. And it wasn't just polite to bow. There were political implications in the bow. There were all sorts of things. And I thought, wow. Every time I buy, I'm doing this totally wrong. I have no nuanced understanding of this. I have been deprived of understanding bows my entire life. I had this moment of cultural dissonance thinking about bowing. I don't know if that helps or not. Yeah. The one that's coming to mind, I think, is even though I've kind of identified as understanding marginalized communities and, and I created a residency program in health equity back in 2008. And so I was really infused in the culture of health equity. I don't think I understood decolonization until I was, um, it was a social innovation residency. So they had us all live at the Banff Center for one month. And we were learning from a woman named Frances Wesley, who was running social innovation generation out of the University of Waterloo. And there was 21 of us in the cohort all across Canada And one of our teachers was named Vanessa Andriotti, and she is Indigenous Brazilian. And the exercises that she taught us, I mean, the one that's coming to mind was called the bus, where everything that we had to interact with that she was sharing with us, we had to not look at it from our perspective, but we had to look at it from the bus who lives within us who's driving the bus, who's throwing up on the bus, who's partying, how fast is the bus going? And we had to like deconstruct all of the parts of us that were reacting to what she was describing. And her way of explaining decolonial mindset was so nerve wracking that a lot of us got nauseated. Hmm. We felt physically ill because she was shaking our heads so hard. She's since written a book called Hospicing Modernity. It does the same thing. It's a very, very important but challenging read. It was then that I kind of realized that even though I still have this expansive way of thinking, I'm still baked into a very colonial culture. 
Yeah. And the colonizer mindset. And that was hard for me to understand, but I think it's good that I now understand it because it's only when you see it that you can change it and shift it and do things differently. Hmm. And I'm not perfect by any means, but at least I have a more open capacity to see it when it's pointed out without becoming nauseated. Oh no, I still get really nauseated. Do you? And that's okay. Yeah. It's maybe a sign that you're being shaken, which is maybe what you want. Well, I think I need it. I think people who start to feel like they know something, have a handle on it. (laughs) Yeah. And that they're not doing it anymore and they've reached a destination. I think that's where you can continue to do great harm is to have a little bit of understanding, but feel like you've got it mastered. And my understanding is that I will never master it, that I'm on this journey, but I'm baked into these cultures. Like if we watch what's happening in the States, they're baked into a culture of racism and sexism. And it's overtly playing out right now, but when it wasn't so overt, no one had to face it. And I think if we continue to face these really difficult things is when we have the best possibility of shifting it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So important. So if somebody wants to work with you and they're sort of strategizing or negotiating or you're getting something together to work with multiple partners, what brings out the best in Christy? What do you need to be at your best? Well, there's kind of the internal and the external milieu around that, right? So I have to show up in a way that I'm ready to face hard truths and to be challenged. And so I have to be well rested and nourished and feel kind of my own interoceptive space that I'm understanding how my body's reacting to things. So there's that internal environment that I have a lot more control over. Externally, I appreciate working in expansive spaces. So people who aren't looking just to check boxes, but to looking to see what's possible. So when I run workshops around trauma-informed spaces, there's a lot of themes that we address, such as mental flexibility, providing choice, attunement. But what that looks like in the different environments is really emergent. And so people who are willing to be generative and iterative and playful around how we approach these tough concepts, that's where I really thrive. So it's not to say it's not possible to check boxes and say like, okay, we have to check the box of being trauma-informed and, you know, understanding nonviolent communication. I can check those boxes. But what I love is to kind of think of it as more a well that we're diving into and anything could be in there. It could be like glitter, pretty things. It could be dark slime. It could be anything. And we're just willing to explore what we find. That's where I find the work really interesting. And the other thing that I'm curiously adaptive with is in the social innovation feedback loop where the ecological cycle shows a dissolution and a reorganization and a regeneration of a space. I really thrive in that back loop. I really like when things are falling apart and reconstructing um, and you're trying to figure out, well, what are the resources that are left behind and what can we still do with this? I really enjoy that. So if things have felt like they've undergone a trauma, I love working with that sensibility of what's coming out of the ashes. It's Uh uh the metaphor I like to use is that butterfly. When a caterpillar has to form the cocoon, it dissolves its own skin in acid before it emerges as a butterfly. And I really like building a safe cocoon for that dissolution. What a lovely metaphor. And you're very aware of both your internal and the external processes, which is very refreshing. Um, we're reaching the end of the interview now. Is there something you'd like to promote and some final words you'd like to leave the audience with? Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping that they've been curious about the book. I'm really proud of it. It's called the Modern Trauma Toolkit. And the tagline is, personalized solutions to nurture your post-traumatic growth. And it's a very solution and strength-based sense of material. Every chapter, almost every chapter has personal practices that you can interact with. There is a hidden page with some YouTube videos. I think it's going to be a really important book for people who want to explore trauma in a way that isn't too academic and in a way that is creative and playful. And I think that I've managed to do that. So uh, the website is moderntrauma.com for the book for pre-sales. And on the website, I've 
explored four different metaphors. So the butterfly is one of the metaphors, but there's four other metaphors, one being kintsugi pottery. So your Japanese background is great for that. We explore the concept of when a piece of pottery breaks and then you put it back together and it's more beautiful for having been broken. And I really think that's a great metaphor for post-traumatic growth. And, and the metaphor we've continued to build is that you often do it in community. Like you have to join a pottery studio to know how to make kintsugi and that we learn how to heal in community. So we're hoping to form some online communities of practice around all of the different concepts in the book and all of the concepts that I put out on TikTok. So that is very much emergent and just kind of catalyzed and growing. And then if anyone wants to explore Safer Spaces training, that is the website, saferspacestraining.com. And we have a wait list for either professional bodies. We're hoping to influence standard of practice. Like if you're a nurse or a teacher, what does it look like to be trauma-informed and to have psychological first aid where you can respond to a psychological crisis as a layperson, like somebody who's not a professional therapist? We're designing training programs for that as well as organizations. Big need for that. So I'm just really excited to follow you on that and also really excited to read your book as soon as it's out. Do you have a final word? No, just thanks for that exploration, Marie. It was a really neat way of looking at the chronology of how a professional shows up and why. And that's that's been really interesting. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. And I'm sure our listeners will really enjoy what you had to say. I certainly did. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Marie. You too. Dr. Christine Gibson has used every opportunity in her life to explore expansiveness. From the blue sky prairies her Scottish father escaped to so he could realize his dreams, to the rootedness of her Ukrainian heritage and its embedded traumas, Christine forged a path that created bridges between people who were very different from each other to become a physician, a corporation, and a not-for-profit co-founder. Her experience of being in an earthquake in Nepal began a quake in her perception of the world that even more upended her thinking when she experienced the full force of the effects of colonization during the skilled exercise of an indigenous elder from Brazil. Not one to sit on her laurels, Christine Gibson took her own intense personal experiences and laced them together to her deep curiosity about healing trauma with her background as a medical doctor. The result is a practice that is deeply responsive to the requirements of people's nervous systems and a book called The Modern Trauma Toolkit, which I personally can't wait to read. I am deeply appreciative to have had a glimpse of this groundbreaking work from the mind and heart of Dr. Christine Gibson and hope it has inspired you as much as it has me. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend, rate and review it and tell everyone you know how inspiring the Culture and Leadership Podcast Connections has been for you in your life. Thank you for listening and may Culture and Leadership Connections continue to guide and inspire your day. Hey, podcast listeners, help us reach our goal of a thousand downloads per episode by going to followthepodcast.com slash culture and leadership. That's followthepodcast.com slash culture and leadership. If you type that into your browser and you use the and sign, not the word and culture and leadership, it will automatically adjust to your phone and then you can follow and rate. So follow the podcast.com slash culture and leadership. Thanks in advance for following and for reviewing.